Hello, and welcome to the Junaspar Introducing Even More Virtual Goodness Session. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. If you have a question at any time during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box on your screen. Now I would like to turn the floor over to Alexi Mens. Please go ahead, sir. Thanks, Patricia. Everybody, welcome to the session for Junosphere. I'm Alexi Mens. I'm the Product Management Director for Junosphere, and I'm very excited to be here to tell you about Junosphere, what Junosphere is, and with a new release, what it can now do compared to what we were previously able to do. So my goal for this session is kind of half and half, 30 minutes roughly, maybe a little bit less if I'm faster with the slides. I want to spend roughly half the session on giving you an introduction to Junosphere, an overview of Junosphere, where Junosphere can add value to you, what it does for you, kind of what it's about. And then the remainder of the time, about half the time, I'd like to spend on actually giving a live demo of Junosphere. That's probably much more interested in going through slides, so I want to devote as much time as I can to that. I'll show you what the new version of Junosphere, released literally a week ago, can do, what are the big advantages there, um, and do something actually live in that demonstration. So hopefully this will be kind of a good combination of um, overarching overview and then kind of very hands-on, very tactical live demo of Junosphere. So why don't we get started? So one of the things that we, as a, as a business unit, look at is physical lab environments. There are lots of challenges that network operators have in general, but there are particularly egregious challenges and issues they face around their labs. So from what we have heard from what other folks at Juniper have heard around customer challenges in physical labs, they fall into kind of three big categories. Um, and that's basically a result of the fact that physical labs are kind of a second-class citizen compared to production networks. They don't generate any revenue. They're almost the afterthought even though they're absolutely, absolutely critical to your environment. A, whether it's a large service provider or a medium-sized enterprise, you want to make sure your production environment is going to work properly. For that to happen, you have to make sure that that's set up properly and everything else and it's tested, and that's where the lab comes in for the initial design and then for the ongoing testing and validation, verification, bug fixes, et cetera. So it's critical, even though it's kind of something that people don't, don't think about outside of the lab community. And the challenge that we see are kind of obvious, right? There's just not enough equipment. That's the most basic challenge. It costs money, and money's not around. You're going to put that money into revenue-generating services, not labs. Even when there is enough equipment or there's a sufficient capacity to kind of get around, still, it's physical equipment, so it's not flexible. Production networks need to be flexible, but labs even more so, because the whole point of a lab is to actually quickly respond to challenges, to new configurations, new designs, to bug fixes, to go and reproduce something and change it and try it out and test it and hopefully fix it. So with physical equipment, nodes are of a specific type, whether it's a core router, edge router, firewall, whatever, and you're stuck with those, it takes time to set them up and it's very difficult to actually change them um, and move from one configuration to another, one architecture to another. So it's just difficult. On top of all of that, it's expensive. It's physical equipment. Again, there's no money for the labs. There's money for the production environment, hopefully, but definitely not for the labs. Um, and you've got to pay for it somehow. Um, so there's CapEx, obviously, with physical devices. And of course, there's also OpEx as well, whether it's maintenance or additional energy and space expense. So this leads you down the path that's probably obvious, and that is that you have to virtualize. Virtualization is the answer to these challenges but you have to be careful and not virtualize it indiscriminately in such a way that you get a poor approximation of the physical reality. You cannot, um, by moving to virtualization and software-based solutions from the hardware-based lab solutions, you cannot forego realism and kind of the proper behavior. That's the whole point of a lab. You want to be, make it completely realistic, 100% the same as the production environment. Well, so Junosphere is basically that answer to the virtualization. It is industry's first and only cloud-based virtual networking lab. And it actually has all of those parameters we just talked about, all those solutions to the challenges customers face. Again, first and foremost, it is realistic. The behavior of the devices we have, and I'll say more about that later, is identical to the corresponding physical network elements. That's very, very important. I cannot stress that enough. It is not an approximation. It is not something close, but not quite the same. It is the real thing. But of course, because it is a software-based virtualized solution, you get all these additional benefits from, from that. It's scalable. You can easily scale this to hundreds of thousands of nodes if you want. You can scale it up. You can scale it down. 
So it's very easy in that regard, something you cannot do easily with the physical lab. You cannot have thousands of physical devices in a lab. No, no company, whether even if it's a large service provider, will be able to afford that um, and to house that. With Junosphere, you can. It is very flexible. Because it is a software-based virtualized solution, you can very easily and quickly change topology, change configurations. You don't need to actually move physical boxer. You don't need to recable things. So it's that much easier in this virtualized solution. Of course, not surprisingly, it is also cost effective. And that's partly a function of the fact that it's a virtualized solution, so it's much cheaper than a physical solution for obvious reasons. But it's also because there are additional ways to pay for it that, are, uh, that make sense in the software environment and do not make sense in the hardware environment. In particular, I'm thinking about a pay-as-you-go solution. That's something that's been around for a while now. It's something that people are very accustomed to. So when you have a SaaS solution, a cloud-based solution, the pay-as-you-go, pay-per-use model works very, very nicely here, and you only basically pay for what you actually need, not for buying a physical box and having it sit idle if you don't need it. So it's just much, much more cost-effective than a physical solution. And to top it all off, this solution, Junosphere, does not silo, silo you, does not restrict you to only Juniper devices. You can, of course, connect to any devices you have in your physical environment by linking your virtual lab, which is Juniper devices, to the outside world. And there you can host anything you want. We're not, we're not so confident that you'll have only Juniper devices in your physical lab. Generally, people have other vendors, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and we will make sure that you can work, interwork Junosphere with those other devices sitting in your physical lab. So just to summarize, it's a cost-effective, flexible, and realistic approach to the challenges that customers face in regards to physical labs. So just a little bit about the architecture. Very high level, very basic, and just to kind of paint a picture with a broad brush. Junosphere, I already mentioned, is a public cloud. It's a SaaS, software as a service. So when a customer logs into a public cloud, they go through a web browser, as I will do in 20 minutes or so. They go through a secure tunnel, and they get to their own private area, depicted here by this blue cloud, which we call a bank. It's their own area where they do their, everything you know, that they need to do. They have their users, they have their capacity they purchase, they have their topologies they're building, and here's a little kind of pictorial representation of that topology in the blue, in the blue subcloud. Because it is a SaaS, it's a cloud solution, sitting in our data center that we own and operate, customers log into the same data center, the same overarching cloud, but of course their own private area in that cloud. So customer B goes to the pink little cloud here, again through a browser going through a secure tunnel. And those two subclouds, they're separate, they're isolated, they're secure. So even though you are in one giant data center, your own private environment is something no one else can look at, and you obviously cannot look at anybody else. So you're totally separate from each other. You get your own private environment. And I already mentioned this, that while this environment is great by itself, in case you want to go to the outside world, you're not restricted to residing in the virtual world. You can go outside and connect to a physical app using a Junosphere connector. It's a secure tunnel, IPsec tunnel, that allows you to go outside. So that's the high-level architecture of Junosphere in a nutshell. But the architecture is nice. And the platform is nice, but ultimately the question you are bound to ask me at this point, great, so you've got this architecture, it's some kind of virtualization platform, la -di da Tell me about the actual devices you can support. What can I do with this architecture? What can I do with this platform? So that's what I want to spend a few minutes on. So today, Junosphere does not support every single element that Juniper has. We've only been around for a little while. There's plenty more devices we can virtualize and can transition in the physical world to the virtual world, but we have quite a few already. So today, we have two sets of devices. One set that is supported and one set that's beta, that's not fully supported yet, but it works and customers are using it. Just going down this list pretty quickly, we've got, in terms of supported devices, VJX, that's our basic Junos routing platform. That's the device that started it all for Junosphere. We've got a virtual SRX, that's our firewall. This is basically the Firefly. That'll be GA, generally available sometime in the near future. Um, we also have a specially configured BJX, a routing platform configured for internet tables, a BGP feed. And this is particularly convenient if you actually want to simulate internet tables and internet routes. And last but not least, we have a virtual Juno space, the ability to actually manage um, devices. So we've got all of those that are fully supported, and we are continually updating those with the new releases of Junos that are coming out. 
VGS, VGP feed, VSRX, obviously, and Juno Space as well. In terms of the beta devices that we have in Juno Space today, we've got three, and probably the foremost of those is the virtual MX. That's Juniper's kind of golden platform. That's the most successful and most important device, I would argue personally, that we have as Juniper as a company. And that's our kind of um, fancy edge routing box. So we have that virtual version of that. It is in beta, so there's more work to be done there. It's in early stage, but it's already in good shape and customers are using it today. And we're definitely working very hard with the business unit to get it to a kind of a next generation, fully supported version of the MX. We also have um, a, an opt a converged, what's, what's the right name here? Converged packet optical box called the PTX for core routing. So we've got a virtual version of that. It's also in beta. We're also working with the business unit to get it to the fully supported kind of uh, fully functioning version. And we've recently introduced a Puppet server. So we have a CentOS server in Junosphere, but we've recently added a Puppet automation tool that is very popular with the server administration folks. They can rework or work together with networking as well. And now this has been kind of Juniperized and we have that version in Junosphere. So you can have automation in Junosphere as well. So this is the set we have today. As you can tell, there's a lot of focus on routing here. That's kind of our Juniper's heritage. But of course, we do much more than just routing nowadays. So we're working to get more and more devices into Junosphere to enable our users, our customers, you guys, to do much more with Junosphere. So in terms of things that we are working on, uncommitted for tomorrow, and tomorrow is a broad term here. It means end of the year and then beyond, 2014 to even 2015, working on these devices. And they fall into kind of three categories. Uh, one is switching. So switching is here, both wireline, virtual EX, that's kind of the most important thing we're trying to get here, as well as wireless, wireless controller here, and some other things, and access points, things like that. That's something we're working on right now. Um, the other set is to kind of continue beefing up our routing heritage. We've got VMX and VPTX. Those are going to be supported at some point in the future. We're also would like to introduce new devices, kind of more hardcore, so to speak, core routing, so the T-series, that's a VTX, presumably that's what the name will be, and then our newest device in the routing family for access and aggregation, the ACX. Last but not least, there is a broad category of things that are not kind of routing or switching or security specific, but they're more services. Think of it as like four through seven services or something like that. So in this particular case, the one that's going to be kind of first up, most likely, is virtual Juno's content encore, formerly known as MediaFlow. That's our video streaming and caching solution. But there's a number of other layer 4 through 7 services that Juniper is working on, and we are working with various business units to get them to Junosphere as well. And those are kind of in earlier stages, but they're coming in the future as well. So as you can see, we are definitely trying to expand our horizon and really get as much as we can of the important virtual network elements that Juniper offers, so we want to get them into Junosphere. But that's just one, one piece of it. The other piece of it is the partner environment. And this is something that basically nobody has. Oh, I jumped ahead. Let me actually come to the partner environment. Thanks. <laughs> um, and I'll come back to the actual uh, functional uh, specs for some of these devices. So in addition to Juniper devices, Juno Space, various, various elements, and a central server, we have a set of partners. We have an ecosystem of partners. We want to make sure that you don't just use the uh, Juniper device that we have as good as they may be. You want to have kind of access to a lot of different tools at your disposal to have a real functional virtual lab environment. That is the whole goal here. It is not a, a couple of virtual Juniper devices. It is a lab environment, and that's what we're fostering here. So we have a set of partners already, and they offer into two categories. One is kind of network design and planning, and the other one is kind of a traffic testing and network testing. And the ones here are the ones we have today. So we've got Wandel, Packet, Design, Keratin in the former category. And in the network testing and traffic analysis category, we have Spire and Test Center, the gold standard of kind of traffic analysis and new dynamics, which allows you to do layer four through seven, layer seven application level testing. There are many more partners that we're working in their earlier stages that are coming in in both categories, both network planning and then performance analysis as well. And when we actually have definitive agreements with them, we will obviously announce them and broadcast that. So we have this ecosystem of Juniper devices that we ourselves create and control, and then the partner tools. So let me come back 
to the previous slide that I skipped, and talk a little bit about the devices, the Juniper devices that we have. And I want to emphasize a few things about those, just so you have a clear understanding of what we're trying to do with Junosphere, um, and what is the focus of the Juniper devices. Let me come back. So I want to give you this overview of examples. All of the devices we have, they're virtual Junos devices. They run on the hypervisor. It's a virtualized environment, obviously. We use a KVM hypervisor, and they sit on the standard x86 architecture. Okay, so pretty basic here. There's not, nothing special here. But what's special is the devices themselves. So I want to emphasize a couple of things here. All the devices we have use actual, real, unmodified Junos operating systems. These are not approximations. They've not been tweaked. For, for the virtual machine, they are the same exact operating system that you have in a physical device. If it's 12.3 for VMX, we'll have 12.3 for VMX, virtual MX, versus a physical MX. If it's 13.1, it's the same one here. So we follow along with those. So it is, it is not an approximation, it is the real thing. Continuing down that, that path, all devices have a control plane, management plane, and forwarding plane. These are not I don't know, toy devices that are only a control plane that you can play with and see kind of how the protocols work, but nothing else. You can actually send traffic through them, and I will show that to you later. The, these are real virtual versions, but they are real routers and real firewalls and real switches in the future. Where relevant, they provide hardware emulation. So as an example, VJX has a software forwarding plane, so there's no hardware emulation required. It sits on a standard ASIC. Whereas MS, of course, is very different. We have a custom ASIC. They're very special. It's very special. It's called a Trio chipset. You have to have emulation for that, and we do. Our virtual MX does have emulation of the Trio chipset. And the point here is the same as the other two bullets above, that we are providing the same exact behavior, whether it's software-based or originally kind of embedded in hardware, so you have the same exact performance, not performance, same exact behavior and uh, characteristics that you expect in a physical device. We support multiple gig interface. All our devices today support gig interfaces, and depending on which device it is, it's anywhere from 15, or I think, or 16 to 64. So it depends on which device. But all of them have gig interfaces. And the performance, software for forwarding performance here, is tens of Mbps, megabits per second. So it's not very high. It's not going to match up what you expect with the physical MS or physical SRX or physical any other device, but that is not the point here. We are a virtual lab environment, and the goal here is to make sure that you can properly design and test and train for the production environment. We're not here to replace the production environment. We want to make sure the first three bullet points are the ones that we focus on. So we have the same exact behavior, same exact characteristics, even performance is not going to be um, gigabits per second. That is not the focus. So just as an example, this is not a com comprehensive list, just as an example to illustrate a point. Here, a list of supported features for the VJX. We've got similar long detailed list of features for the other devices, and it shows us some basics of what support for a pretty standard routing uh, Junos device. You've got the IPv4, IPv6, you've got a bunch of routing protocols, multicast, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, just as an example. So, we've talked about the partner environment. Let's talk about where Junosphere actually adds value. And this is coming from our customers. Where have they deployed it? Where have they used it? Where, where they are actually happy that Junosphere is something they have that they can work with. And we've kind of seen that it falls across the entire gamut of network life cycle, from the beginning to the end, from kind of conceptual early stage pre-production to very mature production networks and everywhere in between. And the use case fall into four broad categories. The first one is network design. This is the conceptual stage. Typically, it's the architects that get in here. Junosphere is particularly convenient for that because you can design a network. You can actually test it right away. You can actually check that this is the right behavior. And you can say, you know what, this is not the right behavior. I'm going to actually add more routers here or change OSPF neighborhoods or do something else. I think I'm going to reshuffle this and change it, optimize it. Even if it works fine, you want to make it work better and verify that everything is running smoothly. So this is much more efficient than doing it in the physical app where you have to recable things not that easy, it's time consuming, <clears throat> or in some kind of a graphical um, and a PowerPoint example or something like that, um, where you can't actually test, you can actually cannot check that it's optimized, that it's doing what you want it to do. Here you can. It's a really nice use case for that. But of course, that's just a starting point. 
the next use case is very, very broad, and that is network basically testing. And there's kind of some use, use cases here. Having designed a network, of course, now you actually want to test it. You want to you know, validate the behavior, you want to test it at scale. Um, you want to do all of these things, and you can do all of that with Junosphere, something you cannot easily do with any other environment, physical or virtual. Kind of right at the border between pre-production and production, you can then have networks that have been established, whether they are mature production networks or something you've designed and you're already very comfortable with, you know that it works, but you want to do something new to it. You want to put a little new twist on it. New configuration, better release, new MOP, et cetera, write a commit script, whatever. You can pre-test it and see that it, and make sure that everything's running smoothly. And at the other extreme of it, where you've got a network that is mature, that is stable, that's running in your production network today, you can actually, <coughs> excuse me, you can actually troubleshoot it. So you can actually take a mock-up or a copy of your physical network, put it into Junosphere, and and try it out and basically see if you can find bugs and errors. And if you can, you can reproduce them, fix them before they actually mess up your production environment. That's a really nice, it's personally my favorite use case. Because this is one of the few use cases actually that directly uh, integrates in your operation. It's a production environment. And this is the, the link to the, the core of what a service provider or an enterprise does with their network. There's a smaller use case kind of further up the chain, and that is kind of developing new things, designing new things, using the SDK to create new applications. And this is very simple. Instead of having a physical MX to develop something on, as we have a couple of customers that are, don't have money for, they're using a virtual MX for that, developing on it. They just need the platform. They don't need the actual physical device, and this is very convenient for them. And across all of that, there's obviously training, kind of a basic standard use case. And it falls into two of its own little subcategories. One is training new people on Junos, whether you're training for a certification or something else. Uh, there are a number of courses that are run by, by Juniper, but also by our training partners that are using Junosphere for that. And it's very easy for them, it's very convenient for them, it's obviously very cheap for them as well. And there's another slight twist in this training case, and that is actually training people on your own environment. So not on Junos itself, but on the particulars of a complex setup that you have in-house, that a customer has in-house. Or maybe it's a customer service uh, person trying to replicate the physical environment that their customer has, and they can basically train on it and then kind of debug it and things like that. So that's a nice thing here. You can kind of do all kinds of things. It's not just a certification. It's really anything you want. You can set up however you want. Very flexible. So let me continue. I'm going to spend just a 30 seconds on this. This is just one example, I'm going to show you no more, of an actual use case of an actual customer that wanted to design their MPLS SuperCore, meaning they wanted to buy PTXs, the converged um, packet optical device, and they wanted to actually make sure that this very expensive purchase was going to be worth it. They wanted to design, they wanted to test it in advance of actually committing um, tens and actually maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. So very expensive for them. And they had very high standards. A uh, very comprehensive and technical audience, and needed to support a lot of different things at scale with lots and lots of devices. So this is what they actually built in Junosphere. No, I need to load it here. It's just an example of what they built. So they had a large solution. They started with 65 virtual nodes. They ended up with over 100, and they use a lot of different tools that Junosphere has. In addition to using Juniper devices, they use our ecosystem effectively. They use Keratin to actually help import configurations, set things up. They use Juno Space to manage these devices, and they use Iron Test Center internally to initiate traffic and to basically test how traffic was performing and going through here. What's not mentioned here, I don't think, is that <coughs> this is something that's running 24-7 today. They have it also connected through a connector to a physical lab. So they're using a lot of different tools that Junosphere has to offer for the two big use cases that they care about, which is initially design, spend some time on that, and obviously the second big one is testing, and they're spending 90% of their time in Junosphere on testing. And they tweak a little bit here, and then they test and test and test pump traffic, and look at what's going on there. They're not using it for training or for development, but for those first two use cases, this is what they're doing with it. So <coughs> one of the things that I mentioned earlier, my favorite use case, and that is kind of integrating very tightly Junosphere into a production environment. And the use case was take a production environment, make a copy of it essentially, 
and replicate it in Junosphere and then do something with it, troubleshoot it or modify it, reconfigure it, optimize it, whatever. One of the things we are working on next, one of the next big applications at some point in the future, is to allow this copying of a physical network to Junosphere and synchronizing them in an automated fashion. Right now you can do that, but it's manual. You have to recreate a topology that you have in the physical environment, put it in Junosphere and do it from scratch in, in the virtual environment. With this tool here, you can actually do it in automated fashion. Starting on the right here on the little diagram, you've got a physical production environment that is managed by Junospace. Junospace pulls an environment, knows what's going on there, knows the devices, knows their configurations, knows everything about it, basically. So the tool will allow Junospace to basically take that information, pull the network, package it up, send a package in the appropriate format to Junosphere, which is a virtual lab environment. Junosphere takes it, unwraps it, initiates the topology, and, and voila, and you've got that exact kind of clone or copy of your physical topology with all the configurations and everything else in the virtual environment. That's it, at the press of a button. And you can do this in an automated fashion, you can do it in new real time. So you can very closely integrate Junosphere, the virtual environment for the lab environment for testing and for development uh, with your physical environment. Take snapshots daily if you want, even hourly if you want, double check things, troubleshoot, et cetera. So this is something that we've got a lot of anticipation about from our customers and they're trying to push us to move faster and we're trying to move as fast as we can on this. So definitely a big help for large operators, uh, even, even medium-sized operators who actually want to have this kind of tight little link between the physical environment and their lab environment, something you don't typically have today. Excuse me. So with that, I'm going to spend only one slide on the demo before I actually start the demo itself, and we're basically on time, which is great. I just want to explain what what has changed, what Junosphere has introduced so far, what the point of Junosphere 3.0, the new release was. It came out last week, and the goal was just to make Junosphere easier and quicker. It was not about adding new features, although we have added a bunch, and I'll talk about those. It is just to make things simpler. So we spent all our time to making things much more user-friendly, more modern, easier, faster to use. And the goal was just to give users, you guys, more time for everything that you do in Junosphere, from designing and testing to training in Junosphere. It's, it's, it's not fair to you to have you waste your time on figuring out how to use Junosphere, how to do something. We just made it that much more easier, much easier and more efficient to use. So there are a couple of things. We've got a much more user-friendly GUI, a graphical user interface. We've got a navigation tree in the left now that makes it easier to reach your actions, which is obvious what you need to do, no guessing here. And you can have multiple windows together so you can kind of customize as you fit. So definitely customizable. <clears throat> One of the big things we, we've been asked for for a long time is give us a preview of the topology, what it graphically looks like. So we've had a topology wizard from the very beginning, almost the very beginning, to create a topology, but you, you would not be able to see it e easily once you've created it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, when you were launching and when you were using it, what it looked like. You have to kind of leave that area, go and see what topology looked like when you created it. Now you can actually see everything here. You can even see interfaces on the routers. So everything's kind of at a glance. That was the point of this. And the third thing is something you will not see, but you'll feel. You'll feel that things are going to be moving much faster. We've enhanced the performance. We've changed the background, uh, the back-end infrastructure completely. It's totally new. It's, brand it's, it's updated. It's refreshed. So everything should be much faster right now. So basically what you'll see is something like this. You'll see something that's much neater, much cleaner, and easier to use. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and go to share my browser so we can have a demo. And we should be sharing right now. So you should be able to see my desktop. I'm going to go to my browser and go to junosphere.net. So the junosphere.net is the URL for Junosphere, it's a public cloud, SaaS, that's where you would actually go to log in. So if you have a login page here, before you log in, let me say a few things about some of the links here, just so you know what they are, and point out one new thing that we've added. So there is a link to uh, change your password, it's kind of very simple, nothing special here. There is a more interesting link to buy Junosphere. So one of the things I've not discussed yet, because that wasn't kind of critical for this presentation, and that is how to buy Junosphere. 
But I'll say just a few words about that right now. There are two ways to buy Junosphere capacity. One is to go through a standard PO process that a company goes through. That's true of any of the services and products that Juniper offers. You can always do the same thing for Junosphere. It's just another product. But you can also much more easily and more quickly buy just whipping out your credit card, whether it's a corporate credit card, hopefully, or even a private one if you prefer. And you go to this page, this is the credit card portal, and you can buy either Classroom or Lab. Basically, they are very similar. It depends on what you're trying to do. You can buy a certain amount of capacity and purchase it this way. That way, you don't have to go through the entire PO process. You can do it as an individual or as a little group within your organization if you don't need to go through complicated um, bureaucratic process to buy it. So it's totally up to you how you want to do it. You certainly can buy it with a credit card. We don't treat you any differently. We treat you the same level of respect and, and high customer service that we treat everybody else. The one new thing that is here is what we call a toolbox. So this place actually holds a number of items that allow you to learn about Junosphere in a very easy and quick fashion. This is not documentation. Documentation is separate, and there's pages and pages of it. It's well done, but there's pages of it. But this is something very different. These are videos and a tool. So the first thing here is a tool. It's a flash-based calculator. Let me zoom in so you can see. This is something we developed with uh, some colleagues in marketing that is particularly nice. It actually allows you to figure out very quickly, based on your usage, um, how many network elements you want to use, how many topologies you want to run, how many days a week, how long, et cetera, et cetera. Do you want to run it all the time or not? Based on your input parameters, um, Junosphere Calculator tells you what SKUs you need to buy and how many of each. So here's information. And there are two options here. There's an annual plan option, subscription, for those that really want to have it for always on for, for a while, for a year. Or if you want to use it on a kind of much cheaper and easier pay-per-use situation where you, you can buy these regular SKUs of capacity and use them as you go. So it's very nice. We used to get a lot of questions on how much capacity do I need? Well, the answer is right here. So you can just figure out, you can play with it and decide, well, I only have $5,000 to spend, how, how do I spend it? And here's how you can spend it here. The other nice thing here is ability for you to compare the cost between the virtual and the physical. Based on this situation here, you can actually see that Junosphere in every case will be cheaper than a physical solution. And the ones we have, we, the options we have here are a number of different MXs and SRXs. And you can look at number of years for comparison. You can include or exclude CapEx, OpEx, et cetera. And you can look at overall cost savings for Junosphere versus a physical device. So it's, it's just nice to see what it would actually take to do the exact same thing Junosphere can do with a physical device and see that it's order magnitude more expensive than Junosphere. Again, not surprisingly. So that's, that's all I'm going to say about the calculator. The other things I want to spend a few seconds on is these other four icons here. These are all videos. They're all how-to videos. How do I order? How do I use? How do I administer? How do I use Junosphere Connector? Um, probably the most basic one for everybody should be how do I use Junosphere unless you are very proficient, uh, and that takes you probably 10 minutes to become very proficient in Junosphere. But if you want to look at the video, here it is. You click on it. I'm not going to play the video fully for you, obviously. That's my job here. But it's seven minutes. All these are, I think, less than seven minutes. They're quite well done. They're done by professionals, not by me. Um, you get a really nice overview of the kind of key salient things you do in Junosphere and the various uh, setup things, which not all of it I'm going to do today. Um, and it's well narrated, just really nice introductory videos to all the basic things you can do in Junosphere. So I highly, highly recommend you look at them. Even if you know everything, it's still great because things have changed in the previous release, so it's good to become familiar. And I'll try to do that here to some extent, and these videos are a really good source for that as well. So that's all I'm going to say with the toolbox. Let's actually now go in and do something useful in Junosphere. So I'm going to log in with my credentials, demo Alex user. I'm a regular user here with my simple password. So once you log in, you're greeted by a welcome page here. Um, this basically tells you everything that's in Junosphere. These are all the devices that we have. I've talked about that already. And of course, we're adding more. So next release, you'll see this table get bigger and bigger. There are um, some mentions of what's new in this release. We talked about that already. And there's some useful links. There's a link for manuals, so uh, documentation, emailing the team and opening a ticket if you have a bug or some issue you'd like to report. I'll just do the first one just to show you that there is a standard publication page, tech pubs, with all the various documents that are here. You can quickly and easily get there. So as I mentioned before, uh, when I was discussing the new release, all the navigation now is on the left. 
and it's much, much easier to actually find the key things you're doing. You're not looking by what's called objects, you're looking by activities, by, by tasks. What do you want to do in Junosphere? There are four basic things that every user um, will be doing on a regular basis or a semi-regular basis. And they are creating a topology if you don't have one yet or you want to create a new one, managing reservations, managing topologies, and accessing and uh, running active topology, a live topology. So that's why we've actually put these four things into this favorite section here. And everything else, in fact, everything is actually in this lower section here. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm only going to focus on, on the four things that are here. So let's actually do something useful here. Let's create a topology. <coughs> so you've got topology screen. I'm going to give it a name, Alexi test one, two, three, four. I'm going to put in specific location, um, bank, sandbox, and name. As if you recall, when I showed you a little hierarchy of Junosphere, the architecture, the blue and the pink clouds were the banks. So I am here and residing in this bank. I'm a user of this particular customer. Within the bank, you can segment it further into what are called sandbox, individual silos within the customer for, for different users, for different organizations, architects, developers, QA, whatever. And within that, you have specific libraries, folders, if you will, where you can store topologies. So I'm going to store my topology in my bank. That's the only place I have access to. In this sandbox where I have access to it, and a specific library called my topologies. I'm not going to give it a description. Well, let's give it a description here. I'm going to make it downloadable, savable, et cetera, and create it. So that's it. This is my graphical interface to create the topology. I've got a canvas on which I can draw here. I've got a bunch of, of icons which I can drag here. So let me do something very simple. VJX, and I'm going to put the VSRX. I'm simply dragging them with a mouse. I'm going to connect them, make a connection. Here it is, and I'm going to put... I don't know, let's do a CentOS server. Here's a Puppet server, I'm gonna put a CentOS, just because. This is a dumb little topology, I'm not doing anything special here. But all the icons that we have, all the images we have are here. You've got VJX, VSRX, two versions of Juno Space, and BGP feed. You've got the VMX and VPTX that are beta. And you've got a bunch of partner tools as well. We talked about those. Wando, Spiron, Route Explorer, Mew, and Keratin. And again, more are coming. So having done, uh, having created my topology here, I'm going to save it. Once I save it, it says, yes, I saved it just fine, no problem. What do you want to do now? Start it or close the wizard? Well, why don't we start it? It's going to say you can't start it because I put it in the wrong place. I put it in the place where I already have a topology running. So let's actually save and close the wizard. I'm not going to start it just yet. I'm simply going to save it. Let's actually now... Look at where that topology is. I've created a topology. Let's actually find it. <clears throat> if I go to Manage Topologies, you'll see there's a listing of my topologies, everything that I've accessed as a user, and you see the very first one, Alexis Test 1234, is here. I've just created it. It's available right in front of me. One of the nice things we have uh, in this release is the ability to preview it, as I mentioned, here, as opposed to having to go back and kind of try to recreate it or edit it. So by clicking here, you get a preview of this topology, so quite nice. You get to see what it looks like. So if I'm going to look at, let's see, well, this one, here's another example of a topology that I'm not sure somebody created some time ago. You can see a nice detail here. So the other nice feature that we've added in this release is the ability to actually see all of the various connections, all the various links, the, the private bridges, and which interface are sitting on in the particular router. Before you had to go to a file and look at it, now you don't. So if I put my mouse over one of these routers here, I get a listing of all the various interfaces that host these uh, these links. So you can see that private 10, that's the bridge connecting, going diagonally down connecting router 6 and router 5, is sitting on interface gig E003. So you know if that's the link you want to make sure is working, you have to configure that particular interface on this router. Similarly, if on router 5, it's sitting on gig E001, that's the one you would configure. So now everything is at your fingertips. That's kind of the whole point of this. So <coughs> what I'm going to do, because I forgot and stored the topology in the wrong location, in the library where I already have something running, I'm going to copy this topology to a different location. I'm going to click Copy here. I'm going to put it into Demo Sandbox 2. And for simplicity, let's do also my topologies folder. I'm just copying it here. 
So now, if I were to actually sort, or to filter rather, on my topologies, again, another nice feature we have not had before, I'm going to do test one, two, three, four, and you see that I have now two of these, just one is a copy of the other, and this is the one that I can now start. So let's actually go ahead and start this one. Do you want to start it? Yes, I do. It should start fine. There we go. And as it's starting, it's taking me to another window automatically, access active topology, which shows me two things. It shows me what the topology looks like, which I already know, but now I still see it here in front of me. And I can always collapse it if it gets in the way. And it shows me the various messages. Hey, the topology is starting, initializing procedures. It's going to bring up one virtual machine after the other. So it'll take a couple of seconds to get started. While we're doing that, I'm going to go to another window that we have not yet looked at, and that's Manage Reservations, kind of the fourth of the four key actions you would do as a typical user. So one of the things that you need to do as a user is to reserve time in Junosphere. That way you have that kind of system resource set available to you when you want to run it. You can do it immediately, or you can do it at any point in the future. And this is a listing of all the various reservations that I have made or I have accessible to me as a particular user in multiple sandboxes here. And you can see that a bunch of them are red, these are the ones that are expired, and there's a couple that are actually in green, and these are the ones that are current, that are acting right now. So I've got a reservation for sandbox one and one for sandbox two. They're both available here. So if I want to create a reservation, obviously I would just go here and create a reservation in a specific sandbox for a specific capacity for a specific time now or at any point in the future. And it's just going to show up as a blue because that's in the future. So very simple here. While we're still waiting for this one, this is almost done, I'm going to highlight one more point. You saw that I clicked a number of these different um, screens, different actions, and I get different windows for each of those. In fact, here they are. You can actually see them right here. This is a taskbar to various windows. I can go between them and select them. So this is very convenient. You see everything at a glance. Again, it's kind of a common theme here. You can actually even shrink a particular window if you want to see multiple things at the same time. So if I want to see my reservations, I'm going to shrink its size. I can move it around here and kind of see multiple things at a glance. And I can shrink this window and see kind of five or more things together. That way I see my reservations. If I need to see them now, I can see what's going on here. I can see what's going on in the other windows as well. The other nice feature that every single window has, and it's particularly convenient because it makes it very, very useful for what you're trying to do in a specific window, and that is the context-sensitive help. Again, something we did not have previously. Every single window has this little question mark, which when you point your mouse over it, tells you, hey, in this particular window, in this table, you can do this, this, or this. Very nice. It's context-sensitive. It's local help. It's not the global help. You don't need to search for, what do I do here? It's right at your fingertips. So everything's kind of available to you very easily. Let me close this window. I don't need it anymore. We're almost done here. <coughs> I'm going to go back into Manage Topologies and show you a few more things. So these are the topologies we looked at that are available to me in my sandbox, right? Whatever sandboxes I have access to. I've got multiple ones here. But of course, there can be libraries that are available at the level of a bank. So every single user as a customer can access these topologies here. If you have a demo topology, there's only a few of them here. And moreover, we have a set of publicly available, let me close this, publicly available topologies that are accessible to everybody, all customers, no matter what you purchase, whether you purchase one SKU or a thousand SKUs, it doesn't matter, you've accessed all of these for you to use. So they fall, just to focus on the lab here, they focus into a number of different, let me sort by libraries, different categories. So there's a whole bunch of starter topologies, basic small topologies that don't waste a lot of your resources. 2VGXs, 2VGXs and SRX, Spirant, uh, Juno Space, etc. Just to get you started, give you some examples of things you can do with them. There is some specific ecosystem partner specific topologies, Carrot and Maze, New Dynamics, Packet Design, Spirant. Um, there's some other ones, Layer 3 VPNs here with Packet Design and Spirant, for instance. So you can do some, you can learn how to use the, the various uh, partner tools that we have. We've got some advanced topologies. There's a few of them. More are coming. These are kind of more sophisticated things that go into kind of technical routing details, MPLS, OSPF, ISIS, et cetera. These are really good starting points. And there's a few virtual day one books. 
So I'll just spend a minute on this. Um, so one of the things that um, Juniper, as a company, does is publish these day one books, kind of basic introductions to various topics, whether it's firewall policies or MPLS or uh, BGP, VPN, whatever it is, um, that are kind of very quick books that are, that are not very long, just to get you started and used to a specific topic very quickly. They're very, uh, very specific in, in their focus. So one of the things that Juniper has started to do is to create virtual day one books that are actually done using Junosphere. We've got a few of them already. Let me make them a little bit more visible. You can actually see the names. You can see these are the two here. Um, so one is the first one that we, we put out actually some time ago was a very advanced introduction to BGP and VPN. It's a very kind of technical topic. We've had an overwhelmingly positive response. One, it's a really nicely well-written book, so it's just easy to use and convenient. But equally importantly, it was done using Junosphere with videos on how to do that in Junosphere. And it was just very easy to learn hands-on, not just by reading a book, but actually doing something live in Junosphere, something you cannot do otherwise. So it was a huge, huge benefit to training when you're actually training with hands-on tools as opposed to just kind of theoretically. The second one that is about to come out, it's kind of work in progress, it's kind of the opposite. Instead of being very technical, it's kind of the very basic one. It's just mastering some Junos configuration, introduction to Junos, um, and there's more coming. We'll have more on enterprise level switching and some routing and things like that. So there's more that are coming here. These are particularly nice tools that are accessible to everybody free of charge. We don't charge for any of these, and you can use them. And there are two ways to use them. One is <clears throat> excuse me, to take one of these and copy it, to your own environment, so I can copy it to Sandbox One, my topologies here, and I'll, it'll just show up there, and I can run it from there. Or if you don't want to copy it, although it's probably the easiest way to do it, you can just start it. And if you want to start it, because it's a public topology, it doesn't know where, in what environment you want to start it, so it's going to ask you for your own Sandbox. You have to pick up some of the ones that are available to you. But if you copy it, it's available to you in your own environment, you can do whatever, you can edit it, you can change it, you can do whatever you want with it. These guys, obviously, you cannot change because they're the same set for everybody. But this is a nice additional feature that we offer to our customers. Access to this kind of set of starting training um, and introduction tools to to uh, Juniper devices, to Junos, to Junosphere, um, to all of these things kind of in, in one package, and to, and to partners as well. So by this point, we should have loaded, <clears throat> and we have. Topology is now active. This is a very simple dump topology is now running in the cloud. So, great. I still need to connect to it. So even though I started Topology and I'm in Junosphere, Topology is in the cloud, I need to create a secure tunnel to that Topology. So I'm going to click the Join button here. It's going to take me to a new window. This is the Network Connect portal. I'm going to log in with my same credentials, which I think was demo Alexi user. Password is my same one. And I'm going to skip this. I've already done this download of the client. It's going to start. And once it starts, I should have the connection. So don't block. <coughs> and a few seconds later, we'll have the connection. Once we've got the connection, I can actually then SSH or send it into a router and work with the CLI. I don't think I need this. Let me just double check. Yep, it's connected. So you can see that now it's connected. I'm going to close the window. I don't need it anymore. You can see that I'm here as a user, demo like a user. And now the last thing I'm going to show before I'm going to stop and kind of turn to questions is to show you that you can actually go inside and look at the routers. So particularly, you see that I've got three routers, three devices here. One is sent to a server and then two routers, VGX and VSRX. These are their IP addresses. Now that I have a secure connection to, to this topology, I'm going to SSH into, let's say, VGX 10.233.255.247. It's going to ask me, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Log in as Juniper, password is clouds, and I'm here. So I'll just show you the CLI. I'm only going to show you um, just the interfaces, just to show you that the one that's been defined from, from the beginning by the system is a managed one sitting on Gigi 000, and the IP address here is the same one you see here. So they match up, obviously. But nothing else is defined. So even though there's a connection here, right, sitting on interface one and interface one, 
in both cases, they are not connected. They are not configured, I should say. So I still need to configure it. So I'm going to do very quickly make this configuration, and that will be the last thing that I'm going to do before questions. 10.233.255.246. That's the SRX. Juniper Clouds. Ooh. Okay. Okay, same thing. And this is a benign message. So now I'm gonna do I'm gonna try to see if I can set the interfaces. Oops. Set Gigi one unit zero family inet address something very simple. Commit, show, and voila. Now I have just configured in the CLI of this VGX this interface so it can talk to the other device. Let's do the same thing here. Set gigi one unit zero family IPv4 address again something equally simple. Should work. This should be benign. Show and voila. Now let's just double check. Assuming I have not made any mistakes, if I run ping 1112, it's working. So now I've actually configured live in front of you in the CLI these devices, and now they can talk to each other. So with that, let me pause and go back to taking questions. Let's go to questions. So let's let's take a look at the questions. So the first one, Darren Connor, what is the actual difference between class and lab? Uh, Darren, good question. So they are basically designed for different things. Classes, this class product is designed for training, and lab product is designed for everything else, for for modeling, for for testing, for design. Um, However, in terms of functionality, they're the same. The only difference is you get slightly different public topologies. There's kind of more training focused ones for the class and, and more operational focus for the lab environment. But by and large, the functionality is exactly the same. So if you care just care about the functionality, what you can do in devices you have access to, they're the same. And the cost is the same as well. So second question from Darren as well. You're asking about JNT SP, you're going to be running in November. You're assuming whether it'll be using Juniper. So that's a question for the provider of the of the training service, whether it's a partner you're using or you're going through um, Juniper's Edge services, I don't know. We have moved on to 12.3 version for VGX, and some other devices have their own versions as well. So it's really a question for them what they want to use. If they want to go with the newer version, then that's what they'll offer, and they'll make it clear. If they want to stick with an older version because they're more comfortable with that, then that's totally up to them. So we, we provide the images and the platform, and then the actual users of that, whether it's a training partner, education service, or anybody else, they decide what to do with it, so it's more of a question for them. So moving on to Emilio. Emilio, this is like GNS3. Uh, yes and no. So it's in some sense a little bit like GNS3 because we're providing a virtual environment where you can actually graphically create a topology. In most of the cases, it is completely, completely different from GNS3. GNS3 does not provide images. We do. We provide our own images. Genus images, whatever you can scrounge on the net semi-legally, they are all outdated and they're all end-of-life products. We are exactly the opposite. We provide real products that are live. We update them regularly. We've got the latest versions available for the various devices. Um, Genus 3 runs on your laptop, um, and that's kind of restricted by your laptop capacity. Um, Genus 3 does not. Genus 3 runs in the public cloud today, and at some point in the future, it'll be running on, a, on, a, on, a, on an appliance that will ship to large customers. So here you have access to the cloud solution. You can do everything you want with it, multiple devices there. Um, in GNS3, as I understand, you cannot, you do not have any network management in um, GNS3. Of course, you do GNS space. In GNS3, you do not have any partner tools. In GNS3, you do. We talked about those. So in some small ways, it's similar. In most other ways, it is completely different and far beyond GNS3. So another question from Emilio. Can I offer services to my client? Of course, absolutely. So you cannot resell it. You cannot charge it for this. Um, but yes, absolutely. We have lots of users, like the training partners I mentioned in the previous question, 
who buy this from us and they actually they don't resolve units at a time, but they use it as, as part of their solution. So training partners who use it to conduct courses in Junosphere, and they make money of that, and that's perfectly fine for us. We give them a service, and they do whatever they want with it. If you want to provide it as a service for PS, professional services, or you want to use it as a way to mock up or do bug fixes, or things like that to your clients, absolutely. You know, when you want to design things for your clients, absolutely. How you use Junosphere is totally up to you. There's four use cases we talked about. If there's more cool use cases you have come up with, by all means, use them. Of course, we'll be happy for that, and let us know so we can actually um, learn more about the various benefits Junosphere can bring to customers. Moving down the line, Ricardo's question, are there any plans for Junosphere to support switches? Yes, absolutely. That's one of the biggest gaps we have today. We're working on it feverishly with other business units to get it there, and the plan is to have both wireline and wireless switching at some point in the future. For wireline, it's our wireline. Uh, for wireline, sorry, the focus is on EX9200 initially with some others in QFX down the line, but that's very, very much TBD, so definitely unconfirmed and uncommitted. Moving on to Oscar's question. For people who are preparing for Juno Service Provider Certification, support all the relevant switching features yet. Same answer, we don't have switching right now. So we have routing and security, network management, and some and services, but no switching at this point. So stay tuned, that's all I can say. Can customer service access Junosphere as a testing environment? Absolutely. Again, anybody who has purchased capacity can access Junosphere and, and do what you feel is makes sense for you as you see fit. You can reproduce customer cases, you can train people, anything you want. There are no restrictions of what you can do with Junosphere, sky is the limit. Dinesh's question, is there any possibility of reduction to price to, from 50 to something else? So this is a reference to the lowest queue we have, which is um, $50. $5 per virtual machine unit. We sell in increments of 10. Um, at this point, this is so competitive and so much uh, cheaper than any physical comparison. At this point, there's no plan to change that. First question from Kate. Is Juno Space available in 13.1? Um, almost. So we have 13.1. We're testing it right now in Junosphere. We'll probably have it available in not, not too long from now. Right now, the Juno Space versions, we have a 12.2 and 12.3. 13.1 is available. Um, we're testing it, and we'll, be, we'll have it out as soon as we can. Kate's next question, and we're I think we're running out of time. Um, switching? No. It never actually supported switching, so it's there's nothing to fix here. Uh, Darren, all links I've seen are point-to-point -point support. The VLAN tags over those links. Good question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm not as technical as I probably should be, so I can defer that to my engineers and get back to you, Darren. Milan's question. Is Juniper considering to decrease 24 contiguous hour sessions? So similar question to before in terms of capacity and how you use it. Everything's done in increments of one full day, 24 consecutive hours. At this point, there's no plan to change that. That's a granularity that's uh, going to be hard for us to implement, and we're focusing on bigger and better things rather than reducing the granularity. So it's definitely not our focus at this point. We want to get more devices and more functionality into Junosphere, and that's the biggest thing we're focusing on. Uh, Dinesh, Wireshark. Wireshark is something we are going to be putting in shortly. So next release probably we'll have it, although, again, I shouldn't commit to it. Um, definitely something that we are looking into right now. That's a great question. Um, Galeb, can you shut down a connection between VMs while topology is running? No. So there are some limitations on what you can do with the topology. You have to shut down the entire topology, not link by link. But that is something that we are working on for next year. And we're almost done. Um, no, Darren, great question. There's no cost for partner tools inside Junosphere. I mentioned that they are available same exact kind of very democratic way that everything else is. Everything costs the same exact number of virtual machine units. There's no extra charge for it. That's the whole beauty of having the ecosystem. You have everything together in, in, a, in a similar fashion. Um, last question, well, second to last question. Ricardo, cloud version is the one we have today. We're working on an appliance version for large service providers and large enterprises. There's no plan today for the laptop version. We're focusing kind of the, the bigger operational uh, needs of our customers, so that's why laptop will not be the right answer for those. And the last but not least, Milan, yeah, so whatever, the question is MXSRX, the switching capabilities, can we use that instead? The answer is yes. You can use whatever those devices support. So if you can, if layer two, it has layer two functionality that is relevant for you, you can certainly use that by all means. And with that, a minute late, I'm going to stop. 
And um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Hopefully, this was an educational and useful session. Hopefully, you got something out of it. Hopefully, you saw the new release and the lots of value that it can actually bring to you. And I will turn it over to, to Patricia. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Today's conference is now ended.